Before we move on to crawling, that's the homework three, I would like to talk about indexing a representation a little bit beyond the basics of, um, of what we talked and what you have in the homework. And even that, what I'm going to talk about today, is not really um, modern. It's like eight years ago. So I'm going to spend half the time today talking about this a little bit beyond what we discuss as representation and indexing. You don't need to take notes. You could, if you'd like. But this is a bunch of slides that are very famous by now uh, from a very famous developer at Google. Uh, it's, he has a particular job that no one else has at Google, and particular salary also that no one else has at Google. <laughs> he's been there. He's kind of been like the main, not just developer, but the main architect guy for a long time at Google. You know, Google started as a startup at Stanford University, and even though they got a lot of money really quick, and connections, uh, and in terms of, you know, what, what search engine CNN uses internally, things like that, you know? Even though you think it's a big company, you'll have a million dollars, there was no way back then, Google started in 1998, so by like 2003 or four, when they had enough money, it was still not clear how to grow, how to scale an IT company that fast. Even though you had the resources, how do you do it? Like a lot of that Google, a lot of stuff that Google came up with was actually new. The file system, the way to scale the request, the way to index the documents, the way to approach user queries, and then what came along? Maps, I think, right, 2003, 2004. That was completely new to how other systems were doing maps. The news came along, again, new, and on and on and on. Uh, this is playing by itself. That's not my intention. Uh, so what, I, what I'm saying is, even though they had resources, Jeff Dean was one of the guys who actually made critical architectural decisions about how things should go, how research and pro production will go together, what kind of research people at Google would do and when do we declare success in research and move it to a production environment, right? If you, if you read academic papers, I know you, you don't do so much of those as the PhD students, but some of you do, but you'll see that academic papers have a certain flavor. There is a certain setup, typically the same setup like in other papers or other projects. And there's an improvement or say an algorithm or a representation or some new idea and it's typically compared to previous ideas to show improvement, some analysis. It's a pretty standard CS kind of paper, academic speaking. Conferences, journals, so on and so forth. Google cannot approach things like that. For them, success, to claim that something works in a research experimental session, to put it into the production system, is not enough to get a 2% improvement or, or um, you know, statistical analysis like what we do in academic papers. We know some people at Google because I, I've been going through IR uh, information people conferences. One of them is like the premier conference, very famous. And people at Google told us many, many times, and uh, people at Microsoft too, hey, a lot of the good research results in academia and this conference are cute, but are not the kind of results we can take and put in production tomorrow. Okay, there's a gap between what you guys in academia call good and what we can actually implement and run and make money with. Because Google is a public traded company. They have to make money, right? They can't just... Uh, so with that in mind, here's a talk, I think it's from 2009 or 2010, about what, what does it take to do this at scale? Of course, this is not complete reality because there's some trade secrets that they, even this guy who, who invented stuff couldn't talk about. 
Um, so there's a, a bunch of info. A lot of the Google uh, early early typing and, and, and booming problems when, when things exploded for them were, were related to latency. It was not that they didn't know how to do stuff. Where like how do we do it fast enough and scale enough to cope with so many documents and so many users in so many places. They knew that they need more computers. They had no problem getting space. So how do we get more buildings, more space, more AC to cool down the computers? That was not the question. The question was, once we have these computers, how do we make them work together in a, in a low latency? Uh, how do we update things fast? So I think their main decisions are about software. There's some hardware decisions in here too, but mostly are about software. Okay, so they, they grew. Uh, Overall, a hundred times or more, but, but, but there was a period, I think, about 2001, 2003, when they grew a lot very, very fast. And at that point, uh, they were lacking ideas. I remember people who went to work for Google. They had 20% of the time, I don't know if you remember that. They, there was a policy with 20% of the time, you can work on whatever you want. They were constantly looking for new ideas that the, the original developers wouldn't have. Now that that policy doesn't exist anymore because they feel like everything that we could have gotten or somebody new could get easily, it's already done. But there was this policy in place, let's see who has new and interesting ideas that will give you one day a week. You still have to come to your job and you have to work, but you can work on your own idea which is a, a pretty remarkable for a company. I don't think many companies have, I think uh, that was completely new. So latency and growth, um, uh, astronomical numbers, and then uh, they benefited, of course, for, for the hardware natural improvements. With, without, without regard to Google necessarily, Intel processors especially, improved a lot, memory improved a lot, hard drives improved a lot, but that's not because of them, it's just because there was enough demand and all these companies have a lot of research and technology, in particular Intel. Uh, so they benefited a lot from that. Let's see. So this is how Google looked when it started. That was a Stanford lab. A uh, few computers connected somehow. Um, and then here's how they thought about indexers and documents. So there was, of course, a query uh, and, and management system of, of the front end. And then we have indexing and we have documents. Uh, Elasticsearch has, I think, both those things. They have a management system for the inverted lists that's coming from Lucene. The you, you could, with the Java code, go underline and obtain inverted lists. But they also can store the original document, so they, they can, if they, you need the document, they, they pull it out for you, right? They don't go to the inverted list to recover the document. There was a, there's a document stored in there, so. So, uh, Google played a lot with how do we manage shards and English, and that was before uh, Lucene became a stable platform. That was before uh, we had now the Solar and we have Elasticsearch. And in academia, there's some other system developed at UMass Amster, uh, Amherst and Carnegie Mellon. That's a very well-established system. It's called INDRI now. It used to be called LIMR. Uh, it's an academia system that has been used in commercial applications. And there's another one developed at uh, Waterloo. It's called Terrier. You should, you should uh, recall those names, or uh, maybe, so uh, Elasticsearch. I'm going to say Lucene and uh, Solar, I think it's called. Those things are what, what most people know. There is Indri, Limor, and there is Terrier. Those are the only systems I'm aware of that are not proprietary. Google has their own, but nobody has access to that one. Bing has their own, but they, nobody has access to that one either. So, but if you, if you 
If you are a developer, most likely you go in the world today, you're going to use Elasticsearch most likely or Lucene, uh, and you build your own top end on top of Lucene. But these other ones were quite stable by now and, and in development. So the problem with indexing and processing systems is that it takes a long time to achieve maturity, just like the file systems. E even though you have a good research group and engineers working on them, you can't develop something overnight. So pretty much if you work in this area, you'll hit one of those, unless the company has a proprietary uh, system. So we talked about this a little bit in class. We can look at by document or by word and organize things. Uh, I think most systems now organize it both ways. They have access to a word-based uh, encoding, like the inverted list, and the document-based encoding. Originally, Google went by the document encoding. I think their main, um, they, for search purposes, you still have need an inverted list. There is absolutely no way, even, I'm talking about the original Google, 1997, 1998. Even at that point, where we didn't have that many documents, so we talked about 10 million documents or so. If somebody puts a query, and you want to retrieve something related to that query, there is no way to parse all the documents at query time. So there's got to be a sense of inverted list process in advance. But for a lot of their analysis, especially because they do it exclusively with, with web documents, I think it makes sense to keep a document entity. Uh, think about PageRank, right? What is the natural unit in PageRank? We're going to talk about this next week. It's the document, right? Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a unit of the graph, and there's some connections based on the web links to the other documents, right? Um, so, index server, document servers, uh, there's pros and cons for how to deal with those. I, I think since then, more or less, uh, every, every front end of Google system had access to both of them. Um, uh, we know many people by now who work at Google on various applications. And uh, everybody, I think, who goes there to work has to be trained into the uh, Google file system and how data operates, how to get it, so on and so forth. So I think um, for query purposes, you, of course, hit the index first. For any analysis that is, they say, the Google graph or the entity graph or the snippets generation part, that will have to attack the doc servers. A lot of companies over the years, once they grew, eventually ended up managing in-house in hardware. So I think a lot of startup companies started, of course, with computers you can buy from the store. But then I know two other companies who, once they grew, they went to buy components and build their own rack systems with specific components that they needed. So I know of a company who did storage who use a lot of available parts that you can buy from Amazon, but they created their own RAID cards specifically for their storage needs. So Google ended up, I think, creating some of these uh, motherboards, uh, components, uh, particularly for networking purposes. So I think they could use a lot of the server motherboards, memory, they use standard hard drives, standard CPUs, standard RAMs, but the networking had to be done specifically for their needs. So I think they ended up building some network cards. Um, I want to come back to this. Let's see. Um, caching, it's a big deal, but it's known to be a big deal in many applications. So this, uh, this is not necessarily a, a, a IR caching in particular. In, in a lot of algorithms, uh, caching will help a lot. In fact, many algorithms, even basic algorithms that we teach in the algorithms class are motivated by caching. How do you cache things? So everybody's familiar with the caching process. The main idea is if I've seen something recently, I'm going to keep it fresh in memory somewhere, easy to access, just in case I'm going to need it again very soon. Right? That's the basic principle of caching. Now, everything gets cached. CPUs cache stuff, operating system cache stuff, even the booting sequence gets cached 
in, in most computers just because they say if you reboot your computer, very likely next time when you boot it, you're going to go through the same exact sequence, right? Caching, improved performance, uh, I, I don't know what year is this, let's assume 2001 or so, 2002, uh, where at that time they started to grow into uh, uh, groups at Google, so they had algorithms groups, networking groups, text groups, processing groups, hardware groups, so as soon as they have an algorithmic group, those people immediately say you gotta cache your results, because that will improve, you know, it, without major efforts in software hardware will improve your performance by 50%. This is what we're going to start talking about today after the break. How do we design a crawling system? You're going to need a crawling system for your home or tree. Crawling, as I said, it's individual, but when you put the stuff together, that's a team effort. So you can design in a team how do we get his documents or her documents and my documents, put them together. That's a team effort. But the crawler that goes ahead and picks up documents, that has to be individual. Everybody writes their own. So, the basic crawler, I think, by now, everybody knows, In we used to teach this as a main topic in information retrieval, I remember like eight years ago, but by now all students know how the crawler effectively goes. I'm going to count on that, I'm going to say, I give you a few URLs, those are the URLs that I listed, right? You look at those pages, uh, you extract more URLs from those pages, and you keep going, right? Sounds really easy, right? Everybody wrote a crawler before this class? Okay, so if you wrote one, you know it's not that easy. How, how did you write it? As a part of a class or uh, was some other thing? Interest. Interest. Mm -hmm. Part of a class project? For data mining. Uh -huh. Data mining you took here in, uh, with who? Kervinsky. I see. That was uh, probably in the fall, last fall or something? Market research. Market research, a job? Okay. So if you wrote a crawler, you know it's actually not as simple as those things. And you'll see that when you do the homework three, that many things could go off. But the basic idea, conceptually speaking, it's very, very easy, right? And then um, there's a difference between your crawler and Google's crawler. Obvious difference, right? I'm not sure if that's a question for now or later. But there's um, a user agent string that says, hey, it's me. And then I wasn't sure if you like recommended any user agents, because sometimes they'll let you crawl the site if you have a certain user agent. And if you have a different user agent, they'll say, no, go away. So, so they have a politeness policy, right? Uh, yeah. uh, like a robots.txt and, and some user agents. Um, you're talking about the homework. Yeah. I certainly do not encourage you to break any politeness rules, but all those things can be broken. You know, if you can, you can. I'm, I'm moving into something I want to talk after the break, but there is a policy about that ro robots.txt file that you're supposed to follow. Now, if you don't follow it, you can get documents access that they don't want you to get access on by pretending you are someone else. I don't want you to to break that policy. Okay. Uh, it's up to you how to, to, to get those documents. If you get enough documents, according to the homework guidelines, what it says, that's enough. We're not gonna check if you, if, you, if, you, if you break the policy or not, but the TAs will ask you to show where in your code you're reading that robots.txt file and try to follow it. I'm not sure this answered the question. Pretty much, yeah. So, so we don't want, we want to be nice. But if you are not nice in your code, likely nothing's gonna happen. We did bring the university council one time, the, the lawyer from the president, all the way down to the, to the, they followed the chain of command, they came to me and said, hey, your students are doing something that's gonna block the IP for the entire university. That was one of these homeworks when everybody went crawling like crazy and then uh, he got flagged and uh, the university provider, I don't know which was back then. This is, we're talking about way 2007 or eight when we just started teaching this class. And uh, back then they came down and says, 
uh, unless you guys stop or do something different, there's going to be a big problem here. Uh, so yes, we, we accidentally did funny things. Now the systems are so much more redundant and so much more capable than 20 people crawling documents, unlikely for bad things to happen. But the TAs will ask, you need to show where you reading that robots.txt file and what do you do with it, okay? Um, the difference I want to point out between you and Google is that you have a luxury in this homework to skip documents if you want. Dropbox.txt says something, or you don't understand that URL, or you don't understand the content, or you have difficulty of parsing, you can skip it and move to the next one, because crawling 50,000 documents is easy. Right? There's enough documents out there so you can get the 50,000. Google doesn't have this luxury, right? They have to index everything. Uh, when Google started, there were other search engines more organized. Alta Vista, Yahoo, and also Microsoft was on, on, on board, right? So it, it's a matter of competitive, to be competitive, you, you, need, you need to crawl and to update enough stuff as fast as possible. Now, about this I'm gonna talk after the break. There's two kinds of documents from the point of view of crawling, right? One kind of document is say a Wikipedia page about Napoleon Bonaparte, French emperor who did funny numbers in Europe trying to attack Russia, something like that, right? What's about this Napoleon Bonaparte page today? It's not gonna change, right, that often. I don't have to read this page every day, and I don't have to pay attention to this page unless something happens. Maybe some, some vandals dig up his, his grave, do something funny, and then everybody starts asking questions about that. But unless something like that happens, this page, I don't have to worry too much about it. The biggest problem with Google is not those kind of pages. And in some sense, the topics I give you in the URL are more of this kind, like Napoleon Bonaparte. I'm going to ask questions like World War II, uh, hurricane events that relate to the past. Let's say, what was the big hurricane? Sandy in New York? All this information is pretty much settled. My, my point specifically is there is a big difference between events that are settled from what was Sandy, I think it was 2012? So say six years ago, but still settled. By now, most of the information about Sandy is settled. Or Napoleon Bonaparte, who's been settled many, many years ago. There is no new, very rarely there's some new artifact, new history fact that needs to be updated, right? Versus events that are happening currently. Imagine Hurricane Sandy when it was live, when people were displaced, water came into New York City and all that. That's a very different kind of information that needs to be managed differently from a page that's being already set up. So how Google needs to react when, when something is going on, like Hurricane Sandy, and there's updates from all over the place, and everybody's asking questions, and everybody's interested in that thing, and by everybody I mean either people that are disrupted by the hurricane, or emergency management uh, people, like the federal government, or just users sitting on the couch just trying to ask questions about it. That's very different from six years later, 2018, when we are like, okay, crawl that page from Wikipedia. That, that's a very different process. Okay. By now, there's other things going on because social media now plays a big role into this event. If something happening live, you are more likely to get current updated information from social media than from crawling websites at random. So a lot of these concerns don't happen anymore. Prioritizing among uncrawled pages, that, that's not a concern today. Uh, let's keep some things here. That, that's, uh, let's see. Uh, this is laughable today. The, this, this process that they have in place, you know, how do I update my index? Well, I have to take some computers offline, copy the new files on them, and put them back online. Yeah, that's not, that's not how it happens today at all. But this, how about this traffic? 
do when I crawl, I'm Google now. I crawl a lot. I can update my whole index, you know, hundreds of billions of pages every day. Do I should be should I be aware of traffic or not? Right, but how, how do I uh, how do I how do I pay attention to traffic? Does it depend on where you're looking and are you looking in any country or any time of the day? Then the traffic. So time of the day is one thing. I, I could uh, definitely by by the nature of the pages I'm looking at, I will know if those are pages that are being accessed at night or not, right? So time of the day is one thing. Geographical location might be another thing, but that's more related to if there's different content mirror servers, to which one of the mirrors I go. I would much rather go to a East Coast mirror server than go to a you know Asian server if I need to access some, some resource, right? We're gonna talk about that in a second. Uh, traffic is, is another thing that's very different through who actually serves the page. That's not something we have in this class, but by now, today, uh, service of who actually produces the content is not usually the web server you go into. You may think you go to netflix.com slash a movie. The content is coming from a company that serves content, like Akama. Uh, and, and the same thing happened with CNN. If you go to CNN, they have their own computers, but you do not get pages directly from their computers. They have hired a, a, a content serving company that they serve that company and can update live. And when you try to access CNN.com, you actually getting the content from some service company that's designed to deal with network traffic. By the way, Akamai is a very famous company. How many people heard of that? Akamai, very famous company, developed by our friend at MIT, a very famous algorithms guy, uh, Thomas Layton and his networking group. And that was their exact claim of fame, that we can organize network content much better than CNN or Netflix or whoever by scaling. It, it has the same idea, core idea, like Amazon Web Services. We can scale as much as we need, a lot if we need to scale a lot, or a little to scale a little, and by managing everyone's content, we can implement scaling in a financially feasible way. If you are Netflix as a startup, Netflix now has enough money to do their own scaling if they want to, but when you start a company, out of a sudden a lot of users trying to access your website, for a movie company that would be instant crash because movie takes a lot of bandwidth to go. If, if a lot of people try to access your hard drives, it's gonna, it's gonna even, even now I think this is not a completely solved problem. I think Amazon yesterday had some networking issues, right? Because they announced this Prime Day and they were like, how many hundreds of millions of people buying stupid things that they don't, probably they don't need anyway. But just, just saying, even Amazon, who you think is the most scaling networking company in the world, with the most money, by the way, and the most computers, and the best cloud infrastructure ever, even they will go down if, uh, you know. Uh, Apple also doesn't serve their own content. And if you remember, most of the time when they have a new iPhone or a new iPad or something, where the website crashes, right? Scaling up for events like this, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult. YouTube and other things like streaming, streaming a famous game, or soccer game, or basketball game, or some event. A lot of time, those things used to crash. See, this has been improved in the last three, four years, very, very much, but you can see still that even big companies will have this problem. So, what I, what I, that was a divergence, but, but traffic, there's one thing when I'm accessing uh, an a company that serves content like Akamai, and another thing, when I'm looking down to a page, say Virgil's web page, that's on Northeastern server somewhere, right? On these smaller web servers that are, are uh, rarely accessed compared to say a CNN or a Netflix movie, I need to pay attention to traffic, but on Big companies like Akamai, I can probably have a policy with them of how much bandwidth can I use and you know some, some regulation of how to access traffic from them. 
there is the other notion of you know how some pages like typically newspapers don't allow you to read the content if you don't have a sub subscription yet Google can read that content and index it because those newspapers like New York Times want Google to index their stuff so when you type a query the New York Times page shows up yeah, so they have to beat the subscription firewall to allow Google to get in. Okay. So, uh, funny slide here, how did it happen? Was updating once a month. So you can see, you know, November 99 gets, gets processed and then we had to shut down those replicas and then copy the index. And then, you know, now we have uh, the new index. Notice this in here? A fan. Right. Uh, and then uh, this grew up very, very fast. Now we know, I mean, not, not me in particular, but we know how to scale data centers with computers. If you have enough money, uh, there's a well-known process of how to create a data, data center and how to power it and how to manage computers in an hour redundancy. Take a note offline if you need to put another one instead of it. But back then, 2001, this is not, this was not clear at all. So we will have to come up with all kinds of networking in particular mechanisms that will serve well uh, their, their needs. Let's see, index of course have been increased. Uh, what do I want to point out? Um, We need to, to be able to expand the redundancy, right? So the, the vertical line is redundancy. The question is, that Amazon also have, is how many copies of the same thing do I need, right? Um, if you're familiar with RAID systems, this was been a question for RAID systems much earlier than these data centers, right? RAID systems, even before indexing and web came online, they could have uh, RAID 2, RAID 5, RAID 3, RAID 1, that says how many hard drives do you have, how many of them are actually content, and they have a check bit to, to, to validate the data, right? Versus how many hard drives, typically in an array of 10 hard drives, we have eight that stores distributing the data. So if you want to read something, you have to read on all eight hard drives, and that's very fast because you're effectively using eight hard drive heads instead of just one. But they have two hard drives just for redundancy purposes out of 10. So if one of the eight goes down, you can recover all the data from one of those two. And because there's two, you can have up to, up to two failures and still recover all the data. So this comes down ultimately to what's the rate of failure of say hard drives or motherboards or memory or stuff like that. But I think they couldn't figure out a way to do it. So they say, you know what, we need to be able to scale these replicas. We need to be able to start with the system. And if failures are high, we need to increase the number of replicas automatically. If we see that some L1 fails, we need to, you know, more than usual, say, we need to be able to say another replica for L1, please because this seems like it's failing too much. If something doesn't fail that much, maybe we need to reduce the replica. So, so I think this had to be, instead of guessing what's the right amount of redundancy, they had to put in place a system that says, if something fails often, have more replicas for it. And that adds to networking problems. The more replicas I have, the more I have to manage the network. Uh, a lot of performance have been boosted for them. This is not answer this slide. When things, a lot, when things have moved from hard drives to memory, there was a critical moment around 2003 or so where RAM became cheaper and bigger. The, the actual RAM dims, if you remember, the green dims. Uh, out of a sudden, we were stuck at, I don't know, 8 GB, and out of a sudden, those dims could, could be 16 and 32 GB. And uh, motherboards have out instead of four typically four slots to put DIMMs in it, they have, they start having 18 slots. So there was a, a moment where RAM became more available, 
bigger and cheaper. So then I think Google started to move stuff from from hard drives to memory. So they use hard drives as backups, as backend, you know, like sort of saving data. But the main stuff, all the indexes, including the inverted files, were in memory. You, you know, when I told you for more two, we can't store the inverted file in, in memory ever? Yeah, I lied. We can. And that's what actually happens. But you guys can ask for home or two. Of course, we want to store everything in memory, right? Rather than on hard drive. We use the hard drive just as a backup system. Uh, encoding, we already talked about, in particular, some of these. Hoofman, Gamma, uh, we'll talk about rice encoding. It's an easy schema that you can find on Wikipedia. But we talked about byte aligns encodings. Uh, towards at the end of these slides, there's this V byte and big tables that have a management for the control flags. All the control flags at the beginning of the, of the blocks that I want to read. Um, I don't Okay, so when, when data started being high, I think, um, networking is one problem, but the other problem is where is this data residing, right? Uh, for information retrieval purposes, like before other data sciences, but now it's in, in a lot of data problems. I think I mentioned this before, the question is, it's not how, what to do with the data, like an algorithm, like how do I retrieve, say, BM25 or some other mechanism, page rank, but rather is, where is the data and where do I need to do the computation? Moving data to the network, it's usually very expensive. It's an operation that we try to avoid. So if we have a lot of data and we distribute it, we have to distribute it, that, that's a must. How do we move the computation we need to where the data is. MapReduce is a framework that has been specifically designed for that purpose. In here, this BAL have to do with balancing data around, but with some constraints specific to the data, in their case, web documents. How do I balance the data in such a way that I don't break my MapReduce framework? Remember that MapReduce have to have a certain consistency on key value pairs. So I can't just say if this has 300 megabytes of data and this other server has only 20, move 100 megabytes from here to here. I have to keep some properties in place for my file system and for my MapReducing, if that's what I'm using. I think this is before MapReduce uh, to work. So then balancing is not so easy. There are constraints of what can be moved from one computer to another. So balancing is actually an algorithm that looks at data and say, move all those inverted files from there to there. Uh, I, I don't think today this is an issue anymore because again, today the computing hardware is so cheap that we will not move it. We'd rather just start a new server and put the data on it. In fact, even small companies do that now on Amazon machines, every time they need something, they just call for a new instance and run that instance. And uh, Amazon is actually, uh, what's the right word to use here? Abusing the way people uh, think about the cloud infrastructure. In the following sense, Amazon makes more money on the evil machines than on the uh, ones that are actually running CPU tasks. You think that people are, 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 are uh, thinking enough and, and aware of what tasks they have and they will not use a machine more than when they needed to. The truth is, if you leave a, leave a AWS machine either for a while, they're still going to charge you a significant amount of money. And they, they make money that way because people just don't shut those things down when they could shut them down. Okay. Um, let's see, eventually got to big data, big data uh, centers. Current, this is a, a, as of 2009. The design of the racks is in-house. This is quite common now for companies at a certain size. 
But a lot of the components were off the shelves, the same components that you can buy from Amazon. So a lot of the hard drives and memory and CPUs are the same CPUs that everybody has. Um, all these companies will use Linux or some version of Unix. Remember when I told you that if you use Windows, you may be at some disadvantage if you use Windows exclusively? Yeah, because if you go to any such company, uh, all the data infrastructure will be managed by a Unix system. And of course, all the software has to be developed in-house for, for them. The biggest problem for them was the indexing and the file system. So a lot of the new services for the user, like say the news and the maps, require an engineering effort, but not an outstanding engineering effort. Maps would cost a lot of money because they have to have those cars going through the streets and taking pictures and putting all that together. But the actual mechanism for taking maps and scale the page with the maps to see where you are, where you want to go, that algorithm is not that complicated. But the infrastructure to serve all that data in time that is hard to scale. Okay, 2004, eventually they moved to uh, uh, some sort of uh, root servers that would manage what content comes from and every, every under, under that root there will be uh, particular servers that serve different purposes. Uh, even the query algorithms now, the final return list of results that you see is produced by an individual scoring systems. We, we mentioned this a former one. I have individual scoring systems, and then there's a machine learning algorithm that goes over those to rank finally the results. Um, encoding decoding has been a, an issue for them. Uh, I, I think I said that. Uh, as part of their encoding decoding mechanism, these V bytes and the big tables. It is now recognized as a big achievement in, in, in computer science, but Google didn't realize that right away. When they created these encoding systems, for a while they were thinking, okay, it's good, it works, uh, but now we know when they got disseminated in academia that that was actually big improvements. So, um, we, that's one thing. The other thing is we, we talked about these delta encodings. Uh, when I start, if I want to store position information, this is an obvious thing, but people didn't realize it right away. If I have a long document, position as integers will become large integers, right? If I index a whole book, by the end of the book, my, my positions might be in the millions. But if I index the delta, the differences, I'm not sure I said this or not, but I, I think we all understand what that is. Positions may be 1, 3, 5, 10, 19, 25, uh, 82, 109, uh, 225. And if I do just the deltas between them, I get 1, 2, 2, 5, 9, 6. This is what? 57. So that's what delta means. It's a very simple idea. Uh, in particular, for words that are very frequent, those are the words that are guaranteed to appear everywhere. The deltas tend to be almost constant. If you look at the word the, which is the most frequent stop word, the deltas between one the and the next the, it's always a very often a number between one and ten. Right, because every 10 words there's a dot. So the difference deltas would be small integers, but if you go all the way to, to, the, to the least, there'll be big integers. Okay, this is the stuff that we, we talked about at encoding. How do we manage these flag bits? One idea is to, they use two flag bits, and then they all get a group in the beginning of the tag. So you read all the control bits before you know how to read the rest. And these control bits could be organized to be a byte or something easy to read anyway. Um, so about 2007, uh, Google realizes, hey, my, 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 my basic B 
business model of searching web documents and answering questions is very solid, but the world has moved on into having all this other stuff. So uh, I, I'm sure by now everybody saw that when you put the query, obviously there's results coming from everywhere. I think they even have a tab there that we can click on and see which one you want. Uh, by the way, when, when you have this kind of structure and with, these are very different results, right? Images from webs, from videos, from maybe books, uh, you start having a presentation issue. I can pull all this data out for a query fast enough, I'm good at algorithms, but how do I show it to the user? So even Google has struggled with that effort. Uh, around this time in 2007, UI interfaces become a, a field. Visualization and UI started being a, a, an issue even in academia. And by now, I think we offer courses into visualization and user interfaces. The reason is when you pull all this data, the initial approach to how to show it to people was terrible. You couldn't find anything. And if you notice over the years, even paying, without paying attention to Google, did you notice how many times the formats of Google return page changed? But you pay attention to that? How often the way the results are displayed to us, actually they don't look like yesterday. Why do you think they change that so often? Because they keep working on those user interfaces and by now they have an entire QA group which people just like us, not, not even like us, not computer scientists, but they literally take random people and say, if I display those results to you, how easy is to find what you're looking for? That's the essential question on the user interface, right? I can show it to you in many ways, in a table, in a, in a web page, organized with videos at the top, or, or with pictures at the top, or with that, um, what is it? Is it see that table in there? There's a table at some point on the on the right side for some page or some page results with some sort of uh, entity table, right? And if you look for things like actors or movie, there is a bar with similar actors to this one. This sounds very natural when you're a user. You say, "Hey, Google is so smart. They find the same a similar actors to the one I was looking for. I was about about to just ask about this other guy instead." The truth is. This is a complication. If you serve a lot of data that's not consistent, it's not just a list of 10 URLs anymore in that first page. How do you organize it so people uh, could do it? At this task, I'm making a parenthesis, at displaying results, academia has been terrible. We had visualization and user interfaces as part of academia, as courses and conferences and, and you know, like we do stuff with everything. Net inferior to what companies did. Take that in comparison with algorithms. Academia had better algorithms for networking before Google ever existed, right? And, and the initial algorithms a lot of startup companies used could be very much improved. In fact, all companies, once they get a little bit of, of market share or a little bit of profits, they immediately need to hire people who deal with algorithms and development because pretty much the piloting stuff that they have in place sucks, needs to be improved. I have been part of few startups as a consultant because my students ended up working for these companies. And I remember us laughing in like algorithms office hours. This is how this company does this stuff, it's terrible. They didn't know how to implement dynamic programming correctly. Stuff that undergraduate students need to learn. But visualization, even now, if you go to a conference about visualization and you look for the new models that they have, you're gonna be like, nobody ever used this thing in practice. It may have some properties that these people want, in reality, it's not going to work. Uh, we were developing a, a visualization for MGH for, for, for looking at patient records and understanding the diagnosis and diseases. The question was how a doctor who is not a computer scientist can look at that. There's a lot of information there in, in, about that patient. How a doctor can use such a system easily 
and the, 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 they hired a different company, so they, they get a, a system that did everything, it was one of these pages full of stuff. And the doctors close it immediately. They say, I, I don't know how to do this, you know? So that it's, I'm maybe insisting too much on this, but and once you have the data in place, how to make people who are not data scientists interact with it is a real problem today in many uh, uh, computational you know, systems. So that's where the problems with infrastructure, uh, with, a, with a user interface started. Uh, I think the rest is... This is about research versus oh no, one thing. Uh, we mentioned MapReduce, big tables. Big tables we didn't talk about, but in data mining we talk about uh, data structures related to big tables. Uh, GFS stands for Google File System. Uh, that's a thing that comes with all these infrastructures of, of indexers and document servers. How do we pull? data out of it. It's a distributed file system and that's what everybody, research and developers and production uh, uses that. This took a, a long, long time to become mature and the problem with file system is that when you make major updates, it's hard to update everything at once. Right? So uh, I don't know if you noticed, even NTFS what was 4.0 or so when it came along. You couldn't move easily the data from the NT, previous NTFS to the new NTFS had some, some problems. So you had to copy the data. I don't know if you guys remember that. You have to copy the data on a different hard drive that was not NTFS and put it back on the new hard drive because directly from 3 to 4 didn't work. I remember that I had to. OK. Uh, many groups at Google. Um, are working now separately to the main production system. The way they work, they do an experimental cycle. They play internally with the experiments, not unlike academia. Like we play in academia, I'll say a machine learning system to observe results, test, validate, train, test, validate, check, change, validate. That's outside, each group has their own kind of environment. And then at some point, when that, uh, gets validated, gets, gets approved, is being launched. Most groups today that work on these kind of things are the ones that deal, it's not in the slides, uh, deal with the ads. So the, the most experiment that needs to be validated properly before we change something in the production system um, that's very sensitive for Google is the ad system because 99.99% .99 of their money comes from serving ads, right? So I know a few people who want to work on the game theory problems at Google for ads. That is, I'm not sure if you're familiar, um, ads get served by an exchange server that internally does a sort of bidding actions. It's it's kind of like, you know how they sell a, a, a painting at the actions? That's how ads get served. Are people familiar with actions? How do people have uh, actions for a painting? They have a painting, and everybody beats. I want to pay that, I want to pay that, I want to pay that. That happens, it's simulated. When you see an ad served, there's a mechanism like this behind. In other words, an ad beat if, if I want to sell an ad, I bid on, on certain words related to the page where the ad's going to be, and Google has this mechanism, exchange server, that will, will say, I have the following page and the following spots for ads in it. I have the following valid ads that are bidding, and I'm going to select one of those to display. And then there is a feedback mechanism that says, if the ads get clicked, I get a certain amount of money. If the ad gets clicked and the product gets bought because of that ad, that's a lot more money. There's a feedback loop mechanism. But Google does not decide what ads to put on by hand or by heuristics or by machine learning. They have these bidding systems. When you, when you, 
there's a service is AdSense and AdWords that you, you get sign up on and say I have the following ads on display. You bid on certain keywords that you say my ad is related for this keyword so I want to display the ad whenever the page has those keywords in it or email or whatever it is. And Google implements this bidding system depending on how much you bid for the keywords, like how much money you're willing to pay to display that ad, and depending how many keywords are in that page, and depending on their estimate of how many people would click visiting that page, how many people would click on the ad, they're gonna choose the ad that's balancing certain criteria, including their revenue, expected revenue. So a lot of groups work independently on these ads mechanisms, which the theory related to how to bid on ads is, is part of game theory. That's the kind of course that you would take to understand how bidding actions work. Um, people who run these experiments frequently put their hands on things that, uh, I was just on the phone with somebody last week that says my code Pass, passes ads uh, that are worth about a billion dollars every month. And Google still did not implement it. Like, they work for Google. This guy is a uh, part of one of these groups. He says, we managed to show that uh, the flow for one billion dollars will have a certain percent increase if I use this, this change that they're working on the experiment. And um, the guy, the, the reason for the conversation was the guy was complaining to me, Google still is not putting that in the production. He was particularly upset because when something gets put in the production, the, the people who work on it gets rewarded, you know, with a, like a, a more, 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 uh, it's at the end of the year benefits, the, the stock, right? So he was saying, I'm hoping they'll put it by December so I can get the, the benefit. But very frequently, uh, there's a lot of money passing through, and that helps experiments. If I want to validate an experiment on, say, ad systems, most of them are on ad systems. Uh, the more ads pass through and the more money passes through, the more I can evaluate correctly the, the difference between my running code and, say, the existing running code or the previous running code. A lot of product evaluation in IR and in machine learning is not having enough test data. But in Google case, that's not a problem. I think that's what mostly this, this is about. Uh, I have the slides online, so uh, you guys can take a look. Not much about ads here. So ads, of course, being the, the main revenue source for Google, um, they are sensitive. Uh, as far as I know, in all these IR conferences I've been on, Google were willing to talk a lot about algorithms and infrastructure. The Google file system is well known now, the Maverick tools, the, um, the processing times, the query shards, all that. But they're not willing to talk that much about their advertisement uh, infrastructure. Everybody does advertisement today, right? Amazon does ads, um, Facebook does ads, Google does ads, uh, but uh, it's slightly different. Displaying ads on a Facebook page is different than displaying ads on, on a web page or on an email, I think. We'll have something about that towards the end of the course. That's a set of slides. The other stuff that I would like to talk about here. Latent semantic indexing, something that we didn't do for the homeworks. Uh, it used to be, people thought it was a big deal. Now we don't think it's a, as much of a big deal as we thought it is. Um, in particular, indexing is now what, what it sounds like. This is not another way of indexing stuff. This refers, it's an unfortunate choice of a word here, indexing. It refers to representation of the term document matrix. It doesn't refer to the indexing system, how to store inverted files, how to merge files, nothing like that. It refers to how do we represent documents into words. So for, for for reference, I'm going to put here the, the term document matrix. 
I think we, we draw it to documents at, at the left side, and then we have word one, word two, word D. Uh, some of these slides will put it, if we'll, we'll, we'll transpose this matrix, we'll have the terms in here and the documents there. Not the deal. The latent semantic indexing refers to how to represent better this matrix. It's not the indexing as we do it in Homo um, So this is related a lot to linear algebra. And it's very similar to something called dimensionality reduction, that if you took any data mining or machine learning class, you probably studied when you hit PCA. How many people studied PCA in some class? OK. Anybody remember how PCA worked? Yes, we need the composition of the coordinates. So I need to do the composition to get somewhere. But where do I want to get? OK, so let's say the composition. I take some matrix, right? say A. And I want a decomposition like looks like, so matrix decomposition. How was the composition we're looking for was some sort of u times some d times some v, and sometimes v is called transpose because it's a, it's not symmetric, but we want to think of this v as the rows being the columns of some something else. Anyway, it's a product of three matrices. We'll do that. So SVD is a technique that could give us the, this decomposition with certain properties. But there's other techniques. SVD is not the only way to decompose a matrix into uh, U times D times V. Anybody remember what's the property of D? Right, so it's diagonal. So this D, we would like it to look like, I'm not going to say what's on the diagonal because different decompositions put different things on the diagonal. Most likely there are the eigenvalues. And in here is 0, 0, right? So that's a diagonal matrix. That's just the diagonal, 0, 0. Indeed, most of the compositions have diagonal values on diagonal, but not all of them. And some of these decompositions have these matrices upper triangular, like they have one half of the matrix zeros. A top of diagonal or the bottom, some of them do not. Some of these decomposition work a lot better if this matrix is symmetric and something called positive, semi definite. Um, but the SVD is popular because it works on any matrix. Any matrix you can pass it through SVD. Not all decomposition techniques apply to all matrices. So back to PCA. What was the matrix A in PCA? What were we were trying to decompose? Anybody remembers? Feature. Feature. Uh -huh. You guys just studied PCA with me a few months ago, but so you should know. So what was the PCA works like that, sort of? But what is the matrix A when we do PCA? Time. It is a reduced matrix which we get, uh, which has lesser dimensions than that. Mm -hmm. We get less dimensions somehow yeah. in the end, but the covariance. covariance matrix. We take the covariance matrix and we apply this to it, and we show that by using the principal components of the covariance, we respect as much as possible within how many dimensions we choose from. We maybe reduce it from 10,000 dimensions to only 100. Those 100 dimensions will be the most representative because we represent most of the variance or most of the covariance. So PCA has this nice ability to say if things are correlated, which happens a lot in data, right? You can have two columns that are very, very similar in the data. Then I'm going to mix those two columns properly. Covariance matrix will give me for any two dimensions how correlated they are. Right? In covariance matrix, there is a cell value for how correlated feature one is with feature two. 
And so the covariance matrix would be d by d, and will have a value for how correlated each column with other column it is. Of course, the column with itself that's just variance for that for that column. So if I do this, I'll be able to explain most of the variance of PCA within how many dimensions I choose to keep, say, 100. If I choose to keep only 10, of course, I'll explain less variance than with 100, but I'll do the best I can with 10. Algebraically, to not lose information at all, PCA loses information. That's why it's dimensional reduction. Algebraically, to not lose information at all, when can I reduce this matrix, say PCA or some other thing, and actually keep the same, not, not lose information, but reduce dimensionality? When some of these, if I, if I sort these eigenvalues, right, say this bigger than that, bigger than that, bigger than that, if some of these eigenvalues here are zero, by removing them, I get back the same exact matrix. So I'm not losing any information. So that's the principle of all dimensional reduction techniques based on linear algebra. Even though I have 10,000 values, if I pretend the ones that are very close to zero that are actually zero, I get rid of them. I remain, let say, top 100 eigenvalues here. If those that I get rid of are close to zero, by assuming they are zero, I'm not losing that much information. So that as an introduction, how can we apply this to term document matrix? This. Let's see. That's the stuff that we've we'll seen. This matrix is the same as this, it's just flipped. Okay. So we've seen cosine similarity before, of course. Uh, that's some problem that uh, with words that we all know, synonymity, that I have multiple words that mean the same thing. Polysemy, I have um, a word that can mean different things. So if I think about this matrix flip this way, I'm going to try to run decomposition, the same idea like PCA, on the term document matrix. Right. So I'm going to say what I would like is to decompose this term document matrix into a product of matrices that it's very similar to this. So M in here, for this to be a correct matrix multiplication, M needs to be the number of terms, right? Because it's N times N. M is the number of rows. K, we'll talk about it in a second. Presumably K is very small, right? This, this acts like dimensionality reduction. In PCA, it's a little bit harder to think because it's not the representation matrix, it's the covariance matrix. So this is not n times d, the data matrix. It's d times d, the covariance matrix in PCA. But in this, k will be the size of this d, right? That if I apply this idea here, that's k, the d. How many people are following me about linear algebra? There's no shame to say I forgot linear algebra. Okay, let's just be clear. We, I'm not assuming that uh, we just get out of linear algebra. So if we if we need some recaps about how linear algebra works, even before eigenvectors, things like how things get multiplied and how it gets uh, uh, ranked matrices and stuff like that, that's okay. It's not essential to understand this idea. I don't want to make a lecture here about mathematics. This is not about mathematics. If you not sure how that works, you can still get the idea of LSI easily. So then N is <coughs> number of tokens. So how do I reduce dimensionality here? I get a small k, right? The actual SVD or non-negative factorials, uh, factorization or other techniques might give me the k, the k that's required algebraically, what's the minimum k for this to be correct mathematics? There's a theorem that says if you want to do this, k has to be at least the rank of the original matrix. The rank is the number of independent rows or columns. And the maximum would be minimum between m and n, but in reality the rank would be a lot smaller. 
So if I get the k equal 2 and this product works correctly, it means the rank of that matrix is 2 or less. Because if I get a rank of 5, k would have to be at least 5. But in practice, we're not trying to do exact mathematics. We, in practice, we are willing to lower k even more than the rank is. Like I said, we can pretend some of the eigenvalues are, are close to 0, even though they are not 0, and say, let's assume they are 0 just to get a smaller, right? Because if I, the more I cut, the, more, the, le the less k is going to be. So people have thought about this as a, as a big deal. Doesn't work very well with documents. Uh, why, why do you think it doesn't work that well? Even if the product is exact. So to get the dimensional reduction in practice, we need um, to make this inexact. We'll have to make some approximations. But even if this would be exact, the problem here is this matrix is too big and too sparse to have linear algebraic properties. PCA, it's a very practical method, right? I'm sure you use PCA for class assignments, but I'm telling you, PCA, don't be shy in practice of PCA. It's a very good approach to many things in, in, in practice because PCA works, but doesn't work for space, for sparse matrices. But in a lot of cases, when you have some correlation between values, it refers to rich, dense matrices, say pixel colors or, or you know, salary values or who knows what's in that column. There's natural correlation between those columns and PCA can deal with those really well. And don't be shy with approximations. Cut aggressively eigenvalues because PCA will keep the correlate, most significant correlations for you in there but it doesn't work with sparsity. In here, most of the, of the rows are zero, right? It's hard to get linear correlations if you have a lot of zeros. Everything looks mostly zero because we only pick if we have, you know, even, even for the homework, you have 85,000 documents, a term like, I don't know, algorithm appears three times, that means 84,997 is zeros. Linearly, when you do linear operations, this sparsity is in the way. So that's one reason for which it doesn't work very well. But if it were to work, that's the basics of SVD. Uh, this matrix in the middle, sometimes it's called sigma, sometimes it's called uh, D. Uh, actually, this sigma is a diagonal matrix there. There's very nice properties for some of these decompositions. If you use linear algebra for, say, signal processing or for uh, representations, rich representations like word vectors, these decompositions are extremely powerful for linear algebra operations. In fact, MATLAB, which is the king of linear algebra, will do decompositions even, you be, even before you ask, just to be ready for certain operations because many Operations are easier once you decompose the matrix into three parts. Here's an example. Of course, a toyish example just made to work. I have a bunch of terms and a bunch of documents, these chapters. And uh, to make it work, I need a 7 by 7 matrix due to the rank of this matrix. Right? But my purpose in practice, see in here I'm reducing from uh, how many columns I have let me rows 8 and 9 to 7, that, that's not an interesting dimensionality reduction. The interesting would be to reduce from, I don't know, 50,000 dimensions by, by what I have here, number of documents, 100,000 documents, to reduce it to a K that's a lot smaller than 50,000, something like 300. So long story short, word vectors work a lot better than this kind of stuff. Okay. We didn't talk about word vectors. Um, so again, in here, by, by shrinking this k, I still have the, the, the document of the tail matrix, but instead of having that many columns, I only have now k columns. So k may be 300, 
I have n long n by 300. The other side is 300 times, however. This is a much smaller representation than 50,000 by 100,000. Unfortunately, like I said, it doesn't work for, very well for text. If it, it, if it were to, to work, I think it would be a linear algebra is a much faster computationally than, say, probabilities or, or, um, or calculus or, or what we do in machine learning, uh, parameter estimation, things like gradient descents and looking for optimality. Those are much harder computational functions than linear algebra computations. You should choose linear algebra from a computational perspective whenever you can, if it does the job. Problem here is it doesn't do a good job. One more thing I have to say about this, because again, it's kind of obsolete as far as I'm concerned in terms of if you go in reality and you try to implement a system, you're probably not gonna use the document matrix decomposition in a linear algebraic sense. You would have to match the query in that space. If you choose to pick a K and do a representation of documents with only K made up features, the, K, the, the query has to be mapped into those K features before we say do cosine or similarity, right? I can't have the query in the original space of the words and then the documents process within 100 PCA features or, or LSI features. They won't match. I'll have to put the query in the same space. There is a very simple operation once I have those matrices that will transform the query in that space. That's good. And then I can match the query in the new space, the K space with the documents by the same functions that I use, say cosine if I want to, or PFIDF or whatever. Um, the good things about this, again, it's operational. Once I get the decomposition, I multiplying those matrices, getting the query transformations back and forth, very easy, very convenient. But the information I'm losing, not being a, a linear algebra kind of operation to recover, it's hard. People have tried to use these decompositions for another very popular matrix in data science. Anybody wants to guess? Not term document matrix. Some other matrix that cause a lot of problems and money in data sciences. Who else has something by something matrix that's big and sparse. Not documents by terms. Images. Images are not sparse. Close. Contents. Contents. Like books. Very close. Who has big matrices of not reviews? So Netflix. What do they have? 70 million users, and how many movies Netflix has? 200,000 or so movies, and what's in it sell? Rating. A rating, maybe other things, but mostly a rating, say one to five, or one to 10, whatever the scale is, right? That's a very sparse matrix because how many movies a user can see? Not, not that many, presumably. I mean, some people watch movies all day, but even then, they don't watch that many, right? It's a big, big sparse matrix. And those uh, collaborative systems, the, the recommendation systems, right? They have a machine learning problem how to deal with this matrix. A lot of academic results, and some of the trials Netflix did, they were too respectful to academia, so the way we try it, if you guys say. They were based on decompositions of this matrix, very fancy decompositions. If you, if you read the Netflix prize, uh, contest that was happening in 2009 or so, a lot of the papers published on that data with results, if not all of them, do a SVD or, or some form of decomposition of the rating matrix first. In practice, sparsity, it's a problem, just like in term document matrix, and the other problem for the ratings is that uh, there's other things than the ratings that come into play right away. Maybe in IR we can get away with document word matrix, because unigrams take you very far in information retrieval, right? I mean, BM25, like I said, it's still 
a very good content search method. You know, uh, you don't need to go to bigrams or any fancy proximity for basic searches. But in movie reviews, there's other information that's 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 critical to get right other than ratings. For example, the actors in the movie or the fact that the user have seen other movies for the same topic, you know. So I think a lot of the modern recommendation systems um, use many other informations than the ratings. Um, Netflix like to say that they get more customers because of uh, their recommendation system is better than others. That's not true. I mean, it's just too cheap and too implemented. Every DVD player has Netflix built in. Um, more, more on that when, later on how recommendation works. Okay, so that's what I want to say uh, about this representation and indexing because we're going to move on to crawling. Both of these issues are not things that we're going to do, but if you do, particularly if you go into research areas, into, into either uh, algorithms research or into infrastructure research, you know, a lot of the file systems and indexing mechanisms um, there are research groups now that do this. You, you can get Internet Academia projects related to how to do distributed indexing. Hadoop does a lot of that. But most people will be the ones, if you do this, you'll be the ones that do some sort of internship at a big company, and then they expose you right away to the infrastructure they have. Okay, so we'll take a break, and then I'll talk about crawling. You asked about the Emily, right? You asked about the word vectors. Uh, so I have two students who work a lot with word vectors. They are not in Boston. But I have one that does some work with word vectors, and I have another master's student who's doing a project with um, word vectors training based on TensorFlow. Maybe would you be interested to? I have a feeling that you want to explore, not, you don't have a particular task, but rather get into that and try to learn how to do it and what your vectors yeah. are and things like that. Yeah, I'm curious what they're working on, and I just want to meet with someone Yeah, yeah, so how about I set up a meeting? So I have one master student who does a project with word vectors, but he is much more advanced than he you say because he is already training them and he has a purpose for this. Mm -hmm. And I have a PhD student who does machine learning who's like co advising in this project in terms of direction, okay, what to do, what not to do. But he's not an expert at word vectors. The PhD experts at word vectors are, are not here. So if I set up a meeting with those guys, uh, I don't know, tomorrow or, or someday, maybe before the office hours, yeah. would that work? Um. But, Oh, so what what time you I don't I don't say tomorrow because I didn't set it up, but if I set up a meeting before the office hours someday, so Thursday at five yeah. or four thirty. Because at six we have the office. Okay. okay. I'm not saying tomorrow, I'm saying let me talk to them and we'll bring you first in one of the meetings. Okay. And we'll spend some time getting you to where they are, what they're doing and why. And then you have to pick an interest. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Four more. You have a question? You are a star. Who is in your team? Who is in your team? Who is in your team? I would, if not, if not, the class is not that big, so if one of you puts it, I'll just wait. Sorry, I can't hear very well, so I do really bad with the relationships. Sorry. So I spoke with him, and I think we were thinking of doing it. Maybe it's about being done. Maybe it's like one of our callers. I think it's one of the more collected pages. And then later, we'll have an elastic search index. So it's a fair one, just since I 
there's a the problem with most sense. Yeah. I mean, you might have just seen some of the others to make sure that. Yeah. And I got a couple of just to see if I can get this. I don't know if it's just that. Yeah. I don't know if it's just that. Yeah. I don't know if it's just that. Yeah. I don't know when you want to be doing it. Um, I, this is next week. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because we allow slightly violence in performance, yeah. you don't process documents the same way as Elasticsearch. Yeah. We don't want to get you into that. Yeah, and right. like Elasticsearch removes the enemy, like the, you know, the dash. The dash. Turns out we need to push it back. Oh, okay. Okay. Did you get that? Your drop is too high. You get the same? Yeah, we have like the uh, World War II. So, World War II, the same model. Can we just pick like anyway? Do you have any receipts? Which one? I think it's the links that they gave us. The same? So, yeah. But, yeah. Wait. And then, yeah. home of one, you go to school. <laughs> so, okay. that's a good yeah. You're doing um, something fun. If you guys have any. I don't know where all of You get in TF room, the other room, something wrong. Talk to each other, right? Anybody else? Who gets similar values, homework one and homework two? Similar within, say, 0.22 to 0.23, we call it similar. Yeah. Yeah? Who gets big drops? I see one. The only one that I didn't do well on so far was the proximity search. And I think I just have a bug in my code. Uh, I'm not sure. Other people were saying on Piazza that they get low proximity searches. Mine's like horrible. Uh, zero yeah. point zero something? Uh, zero point zero zero nine. Okay, that's yeah. random. Yeah. Zero point zero three? Yeah. It's equivalent to pulling a thousand documents at random. <laughs> yeah, I understand. So you, that's why I was saying it was really low. Yeah. That's not, that's easy to debug. Yeah. The hard ones to debug is I get point one four and I need point one six. Because then it's working, it just needs improvement. But 0 0.03. So 0 0.16 is what was the like what are we approximate? For proximity, yeah. I think you can get like 0 0.15 pretty easily, the same like language models. Okay. You can't beat on these queries uh, vector space models like TFIDF yeah. because the queries are too factual. You know? Uh, like you could say, National uh, Rifle Association be really good to get proximity because I want those terms to be close together, right? The thing is, the documents that contain national and rifle and associations already contain them together. There are not that many documents in this index that contain those three words far apart. If they would be, suppose I have 20 documents that contains NRA or National Rifle Association close. And I have another ton two documents in the index that contains National Rifle Associations spread in the document. Then proximity search will be hitting the jackpot, right? It will pull the documents that have it close and will not pull the documents that have it loose. 
but specific terms like this, you guys know what an, uh, an array is, right? It's very unlikely for a document to contain rifle and association separately. Now, if we go on the internet and instead of 85,000 documents, we pull a billion, of course, there will be some documents that contain those words losing text. But it won't happen that easily in this 85,000 documents collection for specific words like that. So if you want to test this proximity search, that's not for credit. The way you do it, you pick a query like National Rifle Association. You look to see how many documents are in this collection that that have those words in them. Presumably, all those documents will have them close, so proximity or non-proximity will pull those documents anyway. Whether I do unigrams or proximity with bigrams or trigrams, I get them. But you can invent 20 documents, make them up, literally, that have the words National Rifle Association multiple times, like each one of those words three times or four times, but spread apart. So you create a document with random words, just make sure it has at least three national, three rifles, and three associations, okay? Index those documents as part of the collection. You should see now a big difference between proximity and TFIDF. TFIDF will see your fake documents and will reward them a lot because the counts are high. You see many national, many rifle, many association, but not together. So a uh, uh, count quantitative vector space model will pull those things and say, hey, I found these documents. They contain your query terms a lot. But the proximity, even if you just look for the one single span, the minimum span, don't count multiple occurrences, just the minimum span, that's it, will pull the documents that have the words together, even though they just one time. So that's where proximity helps a lot. So I don't think we have a lot of data to show this off. Oh, uh, I use proximity uh, together with TFIDF. Yeah, you should beat TFIDF. And did it? Yeah. Huh. So I waited. Somebody else was saying the more I tried, the, the lower it goes. Yeah, it was <laughs> like that until. Uh, you, I, you, you fixed it. Yeah. I said, okay. Mm. Yeah, so I, I don't think uh, the TAs will have some basic value for proximity search. I don't expect to get much more than uh, because I don't think proximity, unless you again come up with some fake documents that will fool the TFIDF but not the proximity, it's hard to showcase how it works. Uh, I'm more concerned of people right now that they have run homework one code for retrieval on homework two, but they're getting different values. But not zero. 0, 0 0.03, easy to debug. You getting 1.9, so 0 0.19. Clearly, it's doing something, right? To get 0.19, you have to do something right. So you must have a relatively small difference between your index and Elasticsearch index. Small differences are harder to find. I had to print out the vocab differences to see what words are. Right. So you have to play a little bit of vocabulary to make it easier at double speed. Typically, we require very similar values just to make sure that your indexing is on par with Elasticsearch. But for now, because double speed, I can go by the homework one thresholds. If you beat point two, we call it good. Vector space, it's easy to beat point two. People have got point three five on, on the best uh, TFID of math. So point two is easy. But normally, we'd expect to get the same performance because we think it's easy to get the same TF values like before. Okay. Um, so what about crawling? What was that slide saying? Crawling. Get seed URLs. 
get docs. This is web docs. Let's call it HTTP HTML docs. Parse them. Extract additional links. The first part's easy. I give you the URLs. Don't have to worry much about that. You put a GET request or a WGET or in Python, whatever function is to get the documents. That should be easy. Pass, find the new links in these documents. Links are not hard to find, right? Because the links have a certain format that's easy to parse. In fact, you're probably not going to write your own parser. You're probably going to call some package library that parses a web document and those packages produce the content. Some are very fancy, they produce ads, menus, content, links, but you need a simple one. You get more links and you store those links somehow in a data structure like array or list or something and then you get back to them and you parse more. I'm serious. It's not that hard, right? Like where, where can it get difficult? So people who wrote the, the crawler, was it that easy or was it more difficult? Yeah. Websites that have drastically different contents. What? And websites have very different contents. So and you get garbage links uh, that leads you to nowhere, and uh, some some domains are very deep and then you got stuck. You so you you get stuck. He's saying, okay, so let's get the getting stuck issue. If I get to some sort of farm of things that are pointing to themselves, especially dynamic links, you know those calendar links, next day, you can go forever with the next day, you're never gonna stop, right? Like, like you get stuck somewhere. Uh, how do you solve that problem? I just set a certain amount of depth. You can set the depth, like how many pages I get from a domain, or you can, when you, when you get a new URL, uh, once you have your collection of new URLs, you pick the next one to go to, maybe occasionally, 10% of the time, you want to jump around. In PageRank, this process is called teleporting. Right? When you're not following the, the mechanism of links, you just jump around to a random one. Uh, very, very, very important concept in graphs. People talk about uh, graph walks, or, or, you know, those things you, you want every once in a while to not get stuck, to just jump somewhere. Okay? So that's one problem, getting stuck into some part that you are not getting out. Uh, now, if you do multi-threading, that's not a big deal, because you can thread your crawler to several uh, uh, paths simultaneously. Even if one gets stuck, the other ones will keep going. What else? Why this is not that easy? I mean, if it's easy, you guys can go home tonight, write a crawler, and be done. What else can get difficult here? Shouldn't you extract only the relevant link? Right, so out of the links that we choose to follow, we should have some mechanism to say which ones do we follow. Because maybe there are too many to follow all of them. Maybe some of them are junk, that's what he was saying. It's not worth following. You're not going to get anything out of those. How hard is that? How hard is to look at the link and say, I'm going to follow it or not? How would you know from a link? How a link looks like, anyway? HTTP. Example.com. Home 
user um, class something html if you look at the link what does it make good one versus bad one can you tell if a link is good before you get something from that link is there a way to tell this link is bad before you even go to that address and see what's there the name of the website hmm? the name of the website name of the website okay so that's one thing some names you might trust some names you don't trust but the problem is going to be most of the names you don't know right now if you get some sort of dictionary online there's those black lists right Here's a bunch of websites that are junk or, or even worse than junk adversarial websites that you shouldn't click on. Get some list like that from online or you get a service that you send a, send a domain and they'll tell you what they think about it. You can do it, but by yourself, most of the names you're going to see blindly in a crawler are not going to be names that you recognize. Like just because it says something, uh, you might have a sense it's a it's an advertisement website, but advertisement from a crawling perspective may not necessarily be bad, right? I mean, somebody may want to crawl ads, and then an advertisement content server is not a bad place to crawl. What else can we tell about the link? Even before we pull some request to get some information from that site. Level. How many levels it has, right? Maybe if it's too deep, it's no good, right? Maybe. But that's not, that's not a, it's a relative criteria, right? Yeah. Can you tell right now that 10 levels is too much and 9 is okay? What else can we do with the link before we go check what's in there? I'm not sure that's gonna help a crawler. Like what, you only follow the S ones? No. Extension. Okay. Some extension, the dot .html? Yeah. If, if there's some extension you're gonna to choose to ignore. I mean, that could be a policy of a crawler, and I think in Homework 3 we allow you to do that. If you don't want to index images, you don't have to go to anything that's dot .img or png or jpeg or songs dot .mp3. But that's a policy of your crawler. It's nothing to do with the link being good or bad. You don't want pictures or PDFs? Don't, don't get them, fine. But, but we only require you to crawl text. So if you don't want to deal with PDFs, MP3s, JPEGs, and PNGs, that's fine. But that's a policy. It's not a matter of the link being bad. The truth is, this is hard to tell if the link is junk by some criteria or not. In fact, that's a cat and mouse game that goes on, on all the time, right? In terms of tricking people to see your content, that it's actually junk content, many people, many, many, many services use a reasonable URL, which may be fake or may not be what you expect or may serve junk. Uh, and it's hard to tell just from the link alone. But one thing is that we can, as I said, look up online, maybe there's a blacklist of domains we shouldn't go. Number two, we can learn this. If I go through this link and I notice that there's not what I want in there consistently, I may be able to tell that this domain is not the domain I want, right? So, this link may be a new link like I haven't seen before, but the domain I may have seen before. So now if I notice I'm getting, uh, I can keep track of per domain, how many requests, proportional speaking, uh, uh, seems to be valid document. And if for example.com, I notice a lot of these links to example.com do not give me back content that's valid, then at some point I'll declare example.com a bad domain and I'll move on, right? 
Uh, you can also, for the purpose of the crawler for the homework, if you get, you still have to get how many documents the home is asking for, but you can have a restricted list of domains. Like you can say, I'm going to Wikipedia, I'm going to .edu, I'm going to, you know, cert certain range of domains, and that's a hard filter. Essentially, you don't let your cr crawler get outside this, this set of domains. I'm going to be okay with that if in the end you get enough documents. And I should say enough good documents. That, that, that's an easy way to prevent bad links. To say, I'm only going to go to some domains that I know in advance. They're good. The blacklists, it's not as good as an approach, as effective, because the blacklist blacks some domains which are obviously bad, but not all of them. So you can still get a lot of uh, bad content. But if you have a good list, a white list, how it's called, then that's much more efficient in, ter in terms of getting good content. So link analysis, that's one big, I, I'm going to make a picture here. I actually have it here, a piece of paper. So we have a link processor somewhere. The way I draw this, the link processor is in here. Link processor. That will have to decide what's a good link, what's a bad link, should I store it, so on and so forth. And this link processor uses data from a processor, uh, HTML processor. So this deals with content, links. Um, things like ads and menus, maybe other things, we'll see that later. Um, and um, let's see, this is the fix. I think I want to have another box here. box that says index. Now, in, for you, the process text, if you use Elasticsearch, when you index, it's built in. There's an analyzer on that. But you're going to have to store in your index links and index content. By content, I mean uh, text. So you can remove a lot of the parts of the web page that's ads, tables, uh, I don't know, tabs, legal notices, all of that. Uh, but you have to keep the main content. Now, for some documents, this is very hard to, to, to just get the content alone. So you're going to have to make false positive mistakes, include some ads and some menus. That's OK. But to miss the main document, the main part of the document, that's unacceptable for pages like Wikipedia. If you get a hard, hard page, like CNN articles, for example, are famous for that. If you try to parse it yourself, never gonna come out right. Uh, Safari, Apple browser has a function called readability. I think now other browsers have it. Remember, when you, when you click that, you see just the content of the document with a lot of parts stripped. Even Apple got that function wrong for many, many years. Now it's better, but before you click on that and you only see half of the document because they wouldn't know how to parse it correctly. Uh, there's a project called Readability that does this, but there's many libraries who can get you the content of the page. So we have these links, and now the links will get to, we're gonna call this, this is the main thing that you're gonna have to do for your uh, 
So the main part of your crawl, cr crawler implementation will be in this box. People who do crawling and crawling systems like to call this frontier management. We'll see where the word frontier comes. Uh, it has to do with the BFS algorithm that, that typically how the cube gets managed. The, the graph traversal algorithm, BFS, has a frontier, so that's why we call it that. So in here, we say get get URL and maybe process the URL. Um, how do we get the document? And here we have things like a head call or request and the get or w get any languages just say get all and uh, politeness policy there was a question earlier about this might have here a thing that we don't deal with. Process other things. Other aspects of the document. Maybe we are interested in more than just the text and the links. Say advertisement, uh, who's the author, um, for what purpose users might be, you know, needing this document. Who, who's likely to, 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 what kind of query, what kind of users would benefit from such a document? Uh, information like uh, pictures, or songs, or is this a patch for a game, or, or is it, what, what, kind of, what kind of information is in it? Is it sensitive, is it a privacy issue? There's all kinds of other things that we might want to process other than what's the text and what's the links. So, Okay. So this is how your crawler is going to move, pretty much. Uh, people are familiar with queues, basic data structure in computer science. So in a queue, how are things moving? This is the front of the queue, right? This is where stuff is coming out. And this is the end of the queue, this is where stuff is going in. Right. So in a, in a queue, typically, the items are put in one end, and the queue is moving that way, so the, the items are getting out the other end. The first in is the first out, right? So sometimes it's called first in, first out. As opposed to a stack, where the last in is the first out. Because whatever you put on a stack is the first thing that gets out. In a queue, whatever you put first gets out first, and whatever you put last gets out last. Right. That's the basic principle. So we're going to have to implement a queue. It's not going to be enough for the crawler. There's another problem that you guys didn't mention here. And we already mentioned the fact that, OK, how do we deal with bad URLs? But suppose all the URLs are good. What's the problem with URLs then? Even for you, you you're not crawling the whole internet. You're gonna crawl specific things like, I don't know. I remember today I put a, a topic for somebody World War Two. So World War Two starts from some Wikipedia page about World War Two, and then there's some battles, and there's some logistics, and then have maybe some political issues with Nazis and all that. Right? You're going to have the following problem, even if you process the bad links correctly. What's going to happen with the number of links as you keep going? How many links are you going to get? 
you start from, I give you two URLs of three or four. When you read those documents, you're gonna get more links. Presumably you add them to the queue. And then what? You have a queue that's 100 links. You process the next document, that gives you 20 extra links, 30 extra links. Very soon, you're gonna have a large queue. Large, large queue. Now, the queue itself is not a problem. The queue can contain thousands of items, hundreds of thousands of items. And what happens, you have a relatively small target. Your target in the homework, I forgot, is 20,000 documents? 30? Something like that, right? It's not hard to get to 20,000 documents. Frontier management refers to the fact that when I have a queue that has many items in it, do I really want to keep the FIFA order? Do I really want to respect whoever got in first, get it out first? Maybe every once in a while, at least, maybe not every, because you do it one document, unless you, unless you multi-thread your crawler, you're gonna get one URL at a time. Maybe every once in a while, every 100 URLs or so, I should look at this queue and resort it. Say, okay, I know I'm supposed to do FIFO, first in, first out. But now that I have 20,000 items in my queue, or 5,000 URLs, can I look at those URLs and make some jump to be kind of more in the front so that if I don't crawl all of them, the ones that I do crawl, get the documents, are better. So frontier management, is a way of saying I'm not happy with FIFO exact. I want to keep the basic FIFO unless, so unless I have a reason for re-ranking the, the current queue, I want to keep it as it is. The first in is the first out. But maybe I have good reasons every once in a while to say this URL that's all the way in the back, it's more important, should jump in the front. That's what this refers to every once in a while. It's impractical to do it for every URL. If you crawl 20,000 items, you can't do this 20,000 times to rearrange the queue. But every once in a while, it makes sense to do so. Uh, isn't it possible that once you crawl about a specific topic, the deeper you go, the, uh, the, the size increases. You get various types of documents then. I mean, you start off with Wordo and you move into transformers, then something related to electronics. So the last of you... At some point you can delivered. move away from the original topic. Now, I used to, I used to um, do this homework tree in a more difficult way, but I simplify it for you because of the double speed uh, of the term. I used to not give you the, give the topic or the purpose, and I used to require you cannot use your own brain to look at those queries and figure out what's about. You're supposed to take the URLs and just crawl from there without thinking what you're crawling. That's more difficult because it's exactly the same, each, this issue. Very quickly you can deviate from the original topic. Even if the first URL is the, the premier Wikipedia document about that, there's many random links in Wikipedia and at some point you're gonna get completely out of topic. So this year you have the topic. You could have guessed it anyway if you look at those, those, square, those URLs, what's about. So if I am to address that problem, how should I do it? So what she's saying is that if you crawl in an expansion, we, we should talk about BFS to, to make sure everybody knows now, what we're talking about, here's the starting point. What does BFS does in a graph? So I have the following graph. If I start here, I'm going to call this zero, that's when I start. And in BFS, BFS stands for? Press for search, graph traversal, right? I follow the links, of course, in the direction of the links. And in BFS, it's waves. 
The last wave, it's called Frontier. That's where the names come from here, Frontier. If I advance BFS once, what's gonna be in my first wave? I mean, I can follow one link. This is one, right? One, one, how about this? Am I getting this? No, how about this? So the, my first frontier is here. Uh, the frontier actually includes only the documents, not the one already processed, right? So now I advanced one from all this frontier if I do it in a batch mode. So this calls for a sequential mode. In this way, I'm not applying this advance to all the frontier at once. I'm just picking one item and move away from that. Right? But if I have to advance from all the ones, this will be a two, right? Because I can advance to it. How about this one here? That's a two. Is that a two? Yes. Yes, because it's obtained from the frontier directly. How about this? No. No? So my frontier now will be these twos. This is the next wave. Wave is because the waves on the ocean are, are one after the other like that, like, like uh, they form this pattern. That's kind of like the pattern we're trying to form here. And then this is a tree, right? This is a tree. And this is a four. Uh, this BFS, it's as opposed to what? DFS. In DFS, in here, the particular order of processing the nodes, zero first. All the ones, a wave is processed all together. Only when I finish the ones, I go to twos. And only when I finish the twos, I go to threes. In DFS, that first search, I go to one node, and before I process the other nodes in BFS wave once, I advance from that node, so I'll process this before the other nodes that were actually closer to, to my uh, starting point. Okay. I'm assuming you are familiar with BFS and DFS? So, is BFS the right thing to do for this queue? I start with some URLs. Right. So think about it. I give you some starting point. I give you more than one. So maybe there's multiple starting points. If I have two zeros here, I give you this. This is the kind of the ones that I put in your Dropbox. In here, why is BFS good? Because I want to get to the closer documents, all of them, first, before I move any further. There's no guarantee of relevance. I could get into this document which is bad, while this one here might have been good. Right? It's no guarantee that would be a first I can get out, but presumably the closer I keep to my starting point, the better the documents are more, more related to the topic I have. Right? So BFS. So you have to implement this frontier management yourself with a queue and with something like BFS. You are allowed to make changes to it as long as the principle is still BFS. So the problem, the immediate problem you're going to have, even for a topic that's a focus crawl, that's how it's called. It's focused because it's very related to a topic, not web at random. It's the number of URLs in the queue. You only need 20,000 things. But the, the homework is requiring you to have some ability to try to get relevant documents. So it's not enough to say, I started where you said, Virgil, I, I started these things, and I've got 20,000 items, or even more, 25,000. But most of them are not about the topic that you give me. That's no good. You have to make somewhere in here an effort to say, some URLs are better than others. The, the obvious mechanism to do so is to promote links that come from documents that have, that appears to be relevant, that appears to be good. So in other words, if this document that you've got here talks about World War II, that's my topic, you have to figure out how do I how do I score that? How do I know the document has the right flavor in it? The links coming out of it are more likely to be good. 
what else can help me? So uh, I'm saying the links coming from a good document are likely to point to good documents. What else can help me? The links themselves can help me? Can I look at this link and say, that's probably good? No? no? Yes? Yes. If it has what? The, the topic that you're looking for inside of the link. How do I know if it has the topic inside of it? That, that's the answer I'm looking for. It How do like the query term. I would have to match this topic in advance, World War II. That's very typical for focus groups. I take my topic and I come up manually, in your case, with a list of keywords. What am I looking for for World War II? Maybe the top words from that page matches the query word in the URL. That's tough. I would do it manually. You may have to do a little bit of reading about World War II if you're not familiar with it, or about who else got, somebody got hurricanes, right? If you don't know what a hurricane is, but most people do, you may have to read half an hour on Wikipedia, what's up with those hurricanes, okay? What are the related interesting words for hurricanes? Damages, surge, wind, category four, blah, 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 and I come up with a list of things. If it's World War II, what would be the words? Europe, Nazis, Atomic bomb, maybe that was at the end of the war, right? What else? Axis, allies. Anybody knows any names related to World War II? Like big, big names, people names? Churchill. Churchill. Anybody else? MIT. What? MIT. MIT? They did the radar. Oh, yeah, but that's, I, I mean, I, I think that's, and the uh, British give it. I think the British give the idea to Americans and MIT implemented it, right? Yeah. And there's the Enigma machine uh, that the British also did. Yeah, so this, I, I meant, I'm not sure if, th that's a little deep, the MIT stuff, but, but how about Roosevelt or George Marshall, you know, these big guys who, who made the war happen, or Hitler. You can come up with, I think, within a half an hour with a reasonable list of keywords that will tell you, hey, this document seems to be about World War II. That's cheating. You can do that on a focus scroll for a topic, but Google has no way to do this when they crawl the web, right? There is no list of words that works for Google. But you can do that and to help multiple purposes. If you have such a list of keywords, you can validate documents almost immediately. Okay? You can validate URLs almost immediately. If the URL contains Midway or Valley of Midway or, or Atomic in it somewhere or something to do with the peace at Yalta or anything like that about World War II. It's very likely to be a good URL. Right. So I think this manual thing that's cheating as far as automatic system goes would be extremely useful on the focus scroll. If you're not familiar with the topic, no shame, it may require you to spend half an hour to read a little bit about it, to come up with your own list of what you think are basic keywords that will help. Uh, internet today uses like shortened links and most of the links which we get out of main links are shortened, like bit later, YouTube links. So uh, those are like shortened link links, so how do we, uh, like we won't be able to. So that's true. I, I think that was true also last year and People have, I don't remember being a problem at all. So you saying those links will not have bottle of Midway in them. Yeah. Um, so I, I didn't think about it. So now that I do, I think not all of them do. You may be missing some, but again, your goal here is to collect only 20,000 documents. So even if you miss some, if you collect some 20,000 data is not be good, that's fine. Wikipedia documents, which a lot of the topics are based on something that will be on Wikipedia. Wikipedia don't have that, right? So that's fine. Uh, I'd be interested in coming up with a way to do that. Is there a way for those links that you're talking about to actually get the main link, the main link before you get to the document? Is there a way to, to map it to the standard URL and then do the analysis before you do the pulling the document. Maybe you can find a way to do so and put it on Piazza for everybody. Visit that and then maybe the whole But visit means what? You get the whole thing. 
I don't know. So that's what I'm asking. Maybe there is a way to quickly map it to the recognize it's such a link, map it to the to the to the reference one, and then do the analysis there. So again, you're gonna have too many URLs to manage. So you may want to do a hard filter based on what documents they come from or how they look. That's not problem number one. Problem number two you're going to have, which is, I think, the biggest problem in a team. How do you know two URLs point to the same document? Okay, there, there, there is more than one way to write this URL and actually refer to the same page. The one of the, you remember this BS sign? BS something that's pointing to somewhere in the page? But as far as we're concerned in terms of crawling, everything with the same up, up to the DS sign, it's actually the same document. So the one problem that you're gonna have when you put the results together is this referred in the notes as a URL I don't know. I have a hard time saying this word. Students always laugh at me because I can't pronounce this. Canonicalization. That is, you want to transform this, whatever URLs you get from the web pages, in a hash key of some kind. Could, could be the basic text or something. In a way that tells you, hey, this document you've seen before, even though the URL is slightly different. Because you, you're going to need to keep an ID of those documents you have seen. And the basic ID that everybody keeps on a crawler is the URL, right? When people refer to web documents, the ID of the document is the URL. But then you want to make sure that two URLs that point to the same document, your canonicalization form of them is actually consistent. And then you want to make sure your teammates do the same canonicalization. So that if I'm in the same team with him and I use an algorithm to do canonicalization and I have IDs for my documents, I want my IDs to match his IDs if we have common documents. If we have common documents, we wanna have the same IDs for those documents. So when he asks, hey, does Virgil has already in, his, in the index this document? How are you gonna ask that? You're gonna ask by the, the document ID, which is the URL. So you want to make sure you have, if we have the same document, we also have the same ID. So when we ask, do we have it or not, the answer is correct. The TAs will ask you for this canonicalization. They will say, OK, how do you take the URL that's from a web page? You know, a, a link is, is presented in two ways in a web page. There is a link, and there is the anchor text. Do we know that? So every link in a web page, it's an actual URL and the text that you see to click on. That's called anchor text. So if you look at the HTML page, how do you see that? If you look at the source page, how is that written? An href equal, what is this? This is a URL, right? Dot, 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 example.com slash slash something HTML, right? This is the URL where to go. If you click on the text, that's where to go. But then what else is in here? Text. Some text, right? So, so click here. Not click here. Let's say President Action Today. And then there is a slash uh, A, something like that. Mm -hmm. What is this? This is called anchor text. That's the text you see to click on. Now, you're not going to see anything because you put a W get request. 
right? You, you're, not, you're not looking with human eyes at those documents. So you have to distinguish, here's the URL I've seen in that link, and here's the anchor text associated with it. Sometimes it's the same. Sometimes you actually see HTTP dot something, you know, click on that, you get to that page. But is there an additional information for us here? Can we use this anchor text for anything? We, we were saying maybe the link has in it words that we like, but that Somebody said that's unlikely because the link points to some server slash some folder in the server. How, how about this anchor text? Is it, is it possible that the anchor text has some very good keywords for us? This is a well-known thing in IR. Anchor text is the most valuable source of information. If you want to know if something is relevant, the best way to tell that link or document or whatever is, is relevant is keywords in the anchor text. If this says, Battle of Midway, by the way, that's a very famous battle, Battle of Stalingrad, very famous World War II battle. It's almost sure that whatever link is there, it's good, and whatever it's pointing to, it's good. If these are keywords that I, I know are related to World War II. Now again, that comes down to that manual list of things that I should have to be able to max those. Right? I have to know that Stalingrad is a good word for World War II which I, I'm not doing that, I'm not giving that in your Dropbox. You get the topic, World War II, and some URLs. So if you hit Stalingrad, you may not know that Stalingrad is an is a, is a important word. You'd have to come up with a list like that manually if you want to do this kind of filter. So canonicalization will be a problem. Most students have difficulty at the team effort when it comes down to merging what I crawl with what he crawled with my teammates because the, the actual IDs supposed to match, because we're gonna have a lot of documents in common, out of 20,000 documents, at least five or 6,000 will be common documents. And we don't wanna duplicate them in the index. To not duplicate them, we need to have a consistent ID system. How do we know that this URL and that URL actually are the same document? So most people have trouble with can canonicalization because their, their IDs don't match. Uh, in previous years, it became so difficult to do this that we allow one team members to use the canoni can mm, can canonicalization code from the other teammate. We couldn't make it work, so we say, why don't you use his procedure for canonicalization so that way you get consistent IDs, okay? So that, that keep in mind that that might be a problem once you crawl the document. Okay, what else can go wrong here? So this is the main part of the crawler. Every once in a while, it's based on a fee for q yes, but every once in a while, you may want to take some of the back URLs and move it to the front to say, I think this one and this one and this one are more important by some scoring criteria, and then move them to the front of the queue. So I would expect every 100 URLs or so to be some procedure there that says resort the queue or rearrange the queue. Some people implement it more realistically. They only allow few documents, few URLs to jump all the way to the front. So suppose I have 100,000 URLs in here. I'm going to allow at most a thousand of them to jump to the front, to not completely reorder the queue. And I'm going to allow every other URL to move a little bit, to re-rank within, I don't know, 10% of the ranks. If this is 100,000 uh, 100, items here, I'm going to allow the re-ranking procedure to move few items anywhere, and a lot of items a little bit. Does it make sense what I'm saying? So in order to keep relative order, we can allow e almost every item to move at most 10% of the size of the queue. If the queue is 100,000 things, we allow everyone to move up to 10,000 ranks, or 5%, 5,000 ranks. But we allow a few URLs, say 100 or 200, that we think are amazing qualitative in terms of the documents, to move anywhere, all the way to the top. So 
And some secondary ranking has to do local re-ranking for all the documents within a few ranks. And it can pull enough for the next batch. The next batch, which is the next 100 documents, I can pull the best 100 and pull them to the front. Now, the next time when I'm doing this, the next time when I do the frontier management, I'm going to have a lot more URLs, right? Because but if I process another 100 documents or another 200 documents, and each of them has 20 or 50 links, I'm going to get a few more tens of thousands of links in my URL. So we also allow to drop some of them. If this gets beyond a certain number that you cannot manage, you say beyond 50,000 or 100,000 URL, when I do the procedure of, of um, managing it, maybe I drop some. I, I just keep, take them out of the queue. Not allowed technically in a FIFO structure, but it may be necessary if it gets out of hand in terms of size. Okay, so that's in here. Getting a URL that's pulling from the, from the queue, the, the one first. Now, if you do multi-thread, you can pull more than one. You want to make uh, somewhat absolutely sure you're not crawling the same document twice. So uh, that's going to be a major uh, point as far as the grading goes. If you pull the same link and you crawl the same document again, that's a big negative. Okay. So we want to make sure it's a new one. Getting the HTML document, uh, there is a head call that you should do first. That will give some metadata information about the document, not the actual document but all kinds of revisions, policy, whatever else is there. You have to play with that. Put a, if you're not familiar with head calls, you can put a head call in Python and see what you retrieve from that document. It's not going to be the HTTP source of the whole document. It's going to be just the metadata. You have to look into that metadata to make some decisions. If it's a song, skip it. Things like that. The get call is the actual call that gives the HTTP source including everything that you can find on the page. Um, and we have a, you have to respect the politeness policy, which is there's typically, we only require, somebody asked this before the break, robots.txt. If that tells, if there's a flag in there, don't crawl me. Then you can leave that document alone. Now, you should know again that if you do crawl it, by, you can beat the robots.txt policy. Um, Probably nothing bad is going to happen, but we want to make sure that you at least read that robots.txt and understand what's in it. Now, the get call will give you a source. That's an HTML string, right? You can find a library who processes this, this string, but if you go to the wild web like that, there's a lot of dynamic things that are happening on the web. So the static information, it's what you use to plain HTML text, either text or links or something like that. Dynamic content gets either generated by the browser when it displays the page, or it gets pulled from some, somewhere else, right? I can have a JavaScript that pulls, say, some text or images from some other server, and you don't have that text in the source, it's just a function call that gets the text. So for the basic requirement of the homework, we're not going to do deal with this. As long as you get out of the page the main static content somehow, that's fine. But fancy crawler will try to attempt to say, OK, there is a call here for information from some other page. I could at least get that URL in my queue, so I'm crawling that later on at the minimum, if not do other things. Dynamic pages are hard to crawl uh, and, and realize that you are in a dynamic, uh, maybe stuck in a uh, loop somehow. So we're not going to require that. But you should know at least when you pass the HTML that there's some dynamic calls being made here, typically JavaScript. And then you have to, to if you don't want to deal with it, you have to just get a static text out of it. Okay, so I'm assuming we're gonna get a library to do this. 
you can try to parse HTML. HTML is notoriously hard to parse. Then what do we have for an HTML processor? Once, once I get the content, uh, I have to do the same analysis like I do in AP89 files. Whatever I do, like stop words and stemming and stuff like that. I could write that. I could do an entity tagger. So if I'm Google and I build a Google Graph, I need to tag things in text. And I definitely want to process links. So links will allow me to form a graph like this, where the nodes are the documents. And the edges are the web links. This is called the web graph. So there is a requirement that you store associated with every document that you index its in links and its out links. So we want to see if you use Elasticsearch, you're going to have a field, the body text that was clean. Most students to choose to put another field that's the HTML source. So I've seen that for debugging purposes, because you know when you get stuck, it's it's very convenient to have in your index a field that shows the actual source. So what I've seen people doing for this homework, there is a an ID that's a canonical URL. There is the HTML source. There is the content clean links in and links out. How am I doing the time? So that's what I've seen uh, uh, a lot of the previous years what students have done. You don't have to do it that way. But links are necessary in and out for homework four and for the page rank graph. Uh, and again, this HTML source, if you want to store it, don't store it. But if you get in trouble, you may want to know what was the source. Um, how do we get links out? So I, I have my hands on a document. I'm right here, HTML processor, right? I process the document. I store the text. How do I get the links out? It's easy, right? Because the links in that document, somewhere in here, uh, when I process the text, I get the links. Most of the HTML processors will give me the content, maybe menus, maybe sections, and the links. Even if you parse it yourself, if the document is not too complicated, it's easy to detect a link. How about the links in? If I process a particular document, and I see a link, it's clearly an out link. Some documents do contain information about references to them, but it's very rare. So most, all documents have the outgoing links in them, in a plain text in that format. So how do I update it links in sort of thing? So remember you can process that. So if I, if I see a link here, I can go to that document and update its link in fields. Presumably those link in and links out has been an array or a list because it's more than one. But what if that document is not already in my index? I say from here a link to a document D. If document D is in my index, I could go to D and say update, put a new link to it. But what if D is not in my index? create a document for index D, but then I have to do the canonical URL to get the ID. Most students, what I've seen, they save some information on the side, and then they process those links. So for links, that's easy. This is difficult. So we have been allowed before to say, OK, parse the links store them in an array, in memory, on a hard drive, somewhere, and only when you're done, go back to this link list 
and fix all the fields in Elasticsearch because there's a requirement that the links are in the Elasticsearch. So when I pull a document from Elasticsearch after it's been done the crawling, I want to see its in links and its out links for the graph purposes. Most people couldn't do it like, like you suggest, you know, create a document ID if it's not there, update the link and hope at the end it's all done. They created a side list of links that they've seen during the crawler from this document to that document. So they literally listed all the links that they have seen and then parse that file at the end again and update the links. I'm not saying you have to do it a certain way. As long as you get the in links and out links at the end in your index, you're good. But that's going to be necessary. So that's where we want to index the text and the links. I think that's the basic of crawling. Uh, enough, certainly enough to get you started. Uh, some of you don't have links. Who doesn't have URLs? You said you created the file. Yeah. Okay. Who else does not have URLs? Did you have a team file in Dropbox? We have it. You want the URLs, don't you? I don't. I will look at it again tonight before I go to bed. You only need something that takes 30 seconds to write. Team. Virgil with three names in it. So you want to get URLs. Who else? You have URLs? I just put the file in. Okay, you have a team then. Yeah. Only two people. That's fine. Okay. So I'll, I'll tonight I'll, I'll update those for people who put the files to make sure we keep going. Crawling, even when it works, might take a while. So you guys should not attempt to crawl in the beginning. 50,000 or 20,000 documents, just in case you have a bug, which is going to happen almost sure. So try to crawl 100 documents to see what happens first. But even when it's settled, and you say, okay, I'm good, this is going to crawl, I leave it running, you have to leave it running for a while because uh, you're not going to get 20,000 documents so fast. There's another thing I have to mention here about politeness policy. Let me write it in, make sure it's on the camera. There is the robots.txt that requires. There's many other things to deal in there, but that's the only requirement for the homework. And the other thing that's required is a, is a time delay. Time delay per domain. So remember when I tell you the somebody from the provost office came to us and say, hey Virgil, your class does something that's gonna shut us down? They require me to tell the students between any two HTTP GET requests, have a one second delay. How much is that if I am to crawl 50,000 documents? 50, okay. That's like eight hours and a half, just a delay. Right? So we're not going to require that. Why do I say per domain? You are required to have a one second delay from the previous call to that domain. That is, if I'm calling Wikipedia, the next call to Wikipedia has to have a one second delay. But other calls to other websites could be done. It's easier to implement this if you do multi-threaded. But if you don't do multi-threaded, maybe you can add something to the frontier management to say, I'm going to promote a little bit the URLs that are on domains that I didn't recently crawl to satisfy that delay. Again, I'm not sure. I think the, there's a Piazza post last year with what's the right delay. Maybe it's not one second. But we don't want you to act like a, like a, a machine gun to websites. You know, because computers can be pretty fast today. If you, if, you, if you crawl a lot, you may put many requests per second, and that's a bad thing. So these are the two things that you have to respect as a politeness policy. Read the robots.txt file and act accordingly, and do not bombard a particular domain with a lot of requests in a very short time. So when you have your crawler done, crawler done, you would have to leave it few few hours at least to get the documents that you need. Now, in terms of the homework, some people organize their team in such a way that when they get the documents, they immediately put it in the index 
uh, in, the, in the connected index, but most students store it separately in a, their own index in Elasticsearch. And when all the three teammates were done with the crawling, they said, okay, we'll run a script now that copies from each personal index. So I have index, he has an index, he has an index. We create a new team index and you write a script that from each computer sends the data from the personal index to the team index, including the validation, do I have the same document or not? If we do, we have to update the document or not, update the links or not. It may be that you have some links to documents that you choose to ignore, but he has this document that you ignore in the index. So if that's the case, you have a document and you have the link out, it's just the link out, the document is not in the index. If your teammate has that document, you are required to know that at the very end. At the very end when you put the data together, if you have a dead link to something that's not in your index, but your teammates pull that document, now it has to be a live link because you have both documents in the index. So that, that, that merging takes a little bit of software effort, but could be very fast. So people have merged indexes in within 10 minutes. Crawling took a few hours. All right, I think I'm gonna stop here. Uh, how, did we go to office hours today? Anyone? Oh, at 2 p.m.? Right, but, but we should yeah. switch it to the afternoon and that's what we want, to keep Monday and Wednesday in the afternoon, everybody knows that? Good. I will definitely be there tomorrow. Anybody proficient in using these cameras? I have a question about it that I can't even.